Hello everyone, I'm Dashaun Farad. Welcome to Writing Exact. Today we have with us another special and phenomenal guest. Uh, Mr. David A. Goldstein is a journalist and sports executive based in Toronto, Canada. He is the chief operating officer of U Sports, which would be the Canadian equivalent of the NCAA. He's an adjunct professor of sports law at the University of Toronto, and he lectures on the topic of his alma mater, Osgood Hall Law School, uh, otherwise known as York University. He is a graduate of the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University. David profiled NBA players for more than a decade in a regular sports feature for the Cincinnati Inquirer. And from 2002 to 2003, he also wrote for Cher, a weekly African, Canadian, and Caribbean newspaper in Toronto. He's recently released a book titled Alley Oop to Aaliyah. Uh, it discusses African-American hoopsters or basketball players in the Holy Land or Israel. Uh, every year, every season, dozens of African-American basketball players pack up their sneakers to play and live in Israel. They eat Israeli food, navigate the is Israeli hustle and bustle, experience cultural and religious customs in the world's only Jewish country, and voluntarily expose themselves to the omnipresent threat of violence in the volatile Middle East. Some players are both black and Jewish by birth. Others chose to convert to Judaism while residing in Israel. Some go so far as to obtain Israeli citizenship, enlist in the Israeli army, marry Israeli women, and stay long after their playing careers end. al -Hoop to Aliyah, African-American Hoopers in the Holy Land, is the first book to provide an in-depth exploration and analysis of the experience of African-American basketball players in Israel from the 1970s till today. Mr. Goldstein, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Now, Mr. Goldstein, is it okay if I call you David? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, we don't like to be so uh, stiff. Uh, you know, it's oftentimes, uh, you know, you being a fellow journalist, we can oftentimes be accused of being too much like Walter Cronkite. Yeah, exactly. No, no formalities needed. Okay, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, we're going to get right to it. Well, first, what inspired you to write uh, this book? So I was in Israel visiting family. My mom's Israeli, and I was visiting uh, my grandparents, and I was in their apartment, and they had some friends over. And uh, I mentioned being from Toronto, and this is more than 10 years ago now, and my grandmother's friends, these 80-something-year-old Eastern European women, uh, started raving about Anthony Parker, uh, who was an African-American basketball player who played for the Toronto Raptors. And I thought, that's so interesting. Why? You know, I wouldn't guess they were fans, uh, and yet... Because he'd played in Tel Aviv, not only did they know him, they followed his career and they loved him as a person. I thought it was so interesting that they felt that bond and I wanted to look more into it. And that's really what started uh, my research process and, and ultimately ended up in this book. Okay, so now uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon because oftentimes when we hear of, 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 of American players, uh, whether they be black or white, we often hear them moving to Israel. In fact, I have a cousin, Kamal Roundtree. He actually played for the European uh, Basketball League. What is it about Israel that is attracting, you know, I read through your book, and your book is a very excellent, uh, uh, now, I don't want to say narration, it's, a, it's an excellent informative piece. What is inspiring so many African American players to move to Israel? Is it the money? Is it the what they perceive to be the lack of racism? What is it? Well, you touched on a, bi on a big one. Uh, you know, the lack of racism is a big deal. So Israel's not perfect. No country is. But generally speaking, by and large, the players I spoke to felt such warmth from the Israeli people and such affection from the Israeli people. And they didn't experience racism, but for a few very, uh, very rare uh, exceptions. So that's a big deal. When you're playing overseas, uh, you know, to feel that exception and, uh, you know, to be accepted and to be embraced that's a big deal. Uh, and then there's other things. It's a, it's a beautiful country. It's a warm, warm weather country. Uh, everyone speaks English. Everything's Americanized. But I think the biggest thing was the love the players felt uh, from the Israeli people and the love they then expressed for the country. Now, I'm, now uh, David, I'm definitely glad you mentioned the warm weather because, as you know, black folk, we're not really moving too many places <laughs> where it's cold, especially uh, playing basketball. Okay, so exactly. now this is what I want to know. Now, of course, you, what you just said, you touch on a lot of this in your book. Now, I must ask you, the indigenous Jewish uh, black Jewish population in Israel, okay, the Falasha, mm -hmm. what I would like to know is did the ball players that have been moving there since the 70s, African-American ball players that have been moving there since the 70s, how do they interact with the Falashas? 
So there, there's a couple of different uh, uh, black communities in Israel. So there's uh, there's Ethiopian Jews, the Falashas that you mentioned. There's also black Hebrew Israelites, which is a, a group of uh, people largely originated from Chicago uh, that, that view themselves as descendants of the lost tribes of Israel, and they live in Israel with, with permanent residency. So there's a few different kind of local black communities um, and, and players interacted with them to varying degrees. You know, these are, are very different individuals and uh, some players became quite close with players, uh, with, with people, excuse me, from the those different communities and others really interacted mainly with their teammates and, and friends, uh, you know, that were uh, Israelis from other parts of the world or, or uh, you know, Caucasian Israelis. So it really depended on, on the individuals. Uh, but, uh, you know, one player actually met uh, his girlfriend, was a black Hebrew Israelite, and they now moved back to Chicago and, and have a kid here. So it can range from not interacting at all to interacting and really integrating and becoming part of one of those communities. It really depended on the player. Okay, now, uh, I'm just curious about the title. Now, Aliyup to Aaliyah. Now, why mention Aaliyah? Are you are you basing that off of the artist Aaliyah? No, it's actually. I'm glad you asked. Uh, Aaliyah uh, is a Hebrew word, and it's a word that actually means uh, a Jew moving to Israel, uh, and it means to. It, it literally means to raise up. And the idea is that you know Israel is the Jewish homeland, and and so if a Jew comes to Israel, they're they're raising up to their their homeland, and and that's uh, what the word in Hebrew means. And so, to me, that summarizes the whole story, is that we, we have players that started out just basketball players, no connection to Israel, and, you know, and, and alley-oop is obviously one of the things basketball players love to do most, um, but they'll go from that to actually moving to Israel and making their life there even after they retire. So, alley-oop to alley is literally the process some players go through, from basketball players who, who visit Israel, really, to actually moving there and, and becoming citizens and living the life there. Now, as you know, uh, David, of course, uh, you uh, being uh, you being in Canada and you traveling back and forth throughout the United States, you have many African Americans who actually are they actually champion the Palestinian cause. Yeah. What I what I would like to know is these athletes that um, the African American athletes that move to Israel, do they at all? Protests, uh, the uh, which is the often perception or the often uh, which people feel is the mistreatment of Palestinians by the Israeli government. Do any of them ever uh, attend any protests uh, uh, dealing with that or siding with any Palestinian activists? No one that I spoke to, as a matter of fact, most of the players that I spoke to uh, were either kind of neutral on the topic or, or on the other side. And, and there were a lot of players that advocated for Israel and, and feel that some of the criticism of Israel uh, with respect to the treatment of Palestinians is, uh, you know, from some of the players' perspective, is, is misguided and, and inaccurate. And so some of the players I spoke to actually will speak on behalf of Israel when they're back in the U.S. and advocate that, uh, you know, again, Israel isn't perfect, but that a lot of the things you see on the news is, is one-sided and, and uh, you know, biased against Israel. And so some of them, you know, are neutral and, and don't get involved, and some of them speak uh, a little bit in favor of Israel, um, you know, and say that, that Palestinians are treated uh, better than people understand and that a lot of what Israel does is in self-defense. And um, so that was one of the really interesting things to me because, again, some of these are, are not Jewish players, they're, they're not even Israeli citizens, uh, or in some cases there are, but they see the country from a different perspective from living in it, and a lot of what they, they like to do is to tell people their opinion when they come back to the U.S. Okay, so have any of these players uh, spoken out then against the recent shootings of, 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 of African-American men, African-Americans over the past five years, the uh, many of the recent unjust shootings, uh, of course, uh, Trayvon Martin and uh, Michael Brown, have any of them had a problem with that or addressed any concern about what's going on, say, with their brothers and sisters back home in the U.S.? Oh, I think it expressed a ton of concern, and one of the interesting things that, that some of the players told me was that they felt safer in Israel in part because of that. Uh, one of the players I spoke to actually was a mistake, and he, he locked his keys in his car. Uh, so it's an African American player uh, who lives in Israel. He's uh, you know he stayed there after he retired from playing. He locked his keys in his car, and he was trying to jig his, his door open. Um, and police mistook him for a criminal, uh, and actually you know handcuffed him and, and threw him to the ground because they thought he was breaking in to try to steal the car. 
And I asked, you know, this all happened in Israel, and I asked him, you know, did you feel upset? Did you did that kind of incident make you want to come back to the U.S.? And he actually said it made him want to stay in Israel more because he was upset that he was mistreated, of course, but he said, you know, all they did was throw me to the ground. If I was in the U.S., I would have been a lot more scared about something a lot worse happening. Um, and so the players very much keep track of, of what's happening here in the U.S. and are, are quite upset about it. And in some cases, it's it's a comparison to why they do choose to stay uh, is they feel a bit safer in Israel of all places. Well, you know, David, it's, it's very interesting that you mention that because when... Uh you know, earlier when I asked you if they felt that Israel was less racist and you bringing this up, what you just said, it actually causes me what I thought about initially earlier. It, it causes me to think of many uh, well-known African-American artists such as Paul Robeson, Josephine Baker and other black artists who actually moved to Europe. Uh, at, at the at the uh, at the height, some would say at the apex of American segregation and many black uh, celebrities have moved to Europe. Uh, at the height of World War II or, or during the height of Nazism and still said that they felt they felt more safe in Europe in, in uh, some would say fascist Europe than they did in democratic America so it's very interesting that you still see that uh, of a parallel almost like a like an updated version of that yeah absolutely it's fascinating okay so what we're going to know uh, before we uh, get off uh, we don't want to keep you uh, David, what I would like to know from you is, what are some of the, uh, okay, the salaries like for many of these players? Because uh, I'm quite sure that in order for you to move to another country and you're a professional athlete, you know, as they say, money talks. What are some of the salaries like? Well, there's there's one team, Maccabi Tel Aviv, is, is the most professional and, and most successful team in Israel by far. They're, they're the closest to an NBA team, and so they'll pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, 500, 600,000 for their biggest star players. They'll get a lot of former NBA players, uh, Jordan Farmer, Norris Cole, uh, Anthony Parker. Uh, so they're the most expensive. Uh, but most players will, will probably play for around 100 to 150, maybe $200,000. Uh, and then in addition to that, they get their apartment covered and they get uh, their taxes paid and usually access to a car. Uh, so it's, it's not a crazy amount of money. But it's a good amount of money, and you're living an amazing lifestyle. And again, you're embraced, and you're a, you know you're a celebrity. Um, players have told me about getting you know free access to clubs or uh, or discounts at restaurants. Some places would even pay players to come because they're a great draw to bring other other uh, customers to the restaurant or to the bar. So you know it. it uh, but again, for salaries, I'd say roughly a hundred to hundred fifty thousand is is probably a pretty ad average. Uh, number for a first division player well that yeah, certainly is it certainly is but i wanted to tell you david uh you know uh, another subject of course which we've been discussing just about all the interview all this interview it's amazing to me how your book it doesn't just deal with sports but you're actually dealing with uh, identity and politics and religion of course race and as we know that for people of African descent, particularly African Americans, that's actually been a struggle for our community. Uh, you know, uh, you know, race, religion. Uh, it's amazing that you actually you actually uh, delve into this subject, uh, in my judgment, quite fairly, because oftentimes people are unaware of the African American psyche, what it's like to be an African American, whether we travel in America or travel elsewhere. It, 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 it's amazing. Uh, you know, I wanted to know how were you able to get the players to open up. Like that, how were you able to, you know, get to get through to them? I I give them so much credit because I am, uh, you know, I'm not a known writer. Uh, I'm I'm this random stranger from Canada uh, that no one's heard of. Calling these players, and and to your point, exactly right. I'm so glad you asked it because I'm asking them not about how many points did you score or how many rebounds did you get. I'm asking. You know, what was it like uh, growing up in, in America? What was, uh, why did you choose to convert to Judaism or not? Tell me about your religion, raising kids, racism you faced, um, challenges with your identity. There's players that were born black and Jewish, and I asked about how they grew up, uh, or raising a kid who's, who's black and Jewish. And, and the players were incredible. I mean, they opened up completely. They shared their, their life and, and intimate details of uh, their identity. Uh, I was blown away by how open they were, uh, and so I give them all the credit in the world. And, and to your point, you know, I think when you're, when you're younger, you think of identity as a checkbox. You're white or you're black. You're Jewish or you're Christian. 
And what I found was there's so many different complexities and variations and gradations that uh, there's every kind of combination. And, and players grew up where their grandparents were in churches that celebrate uh, you know, the Jewish Sabbath, and they didn't understand that until they got to Israel and said, oh my God, my, you know, my grandmother's Christian, but she, she kept the Sabbath. And, and so there's so many different degrees, and, and that was one of the things I was so fascinated about. Even though it's a basketball book, it covers all of that. I notice, I notice. Well, uh, listen, David Goldstein, we thank you very much for joining us, but before we go, we must ask you, where can people find Aliyup to Aliyah? Where can they purchase it? Where can they read it? So you can get it. I appreciate you giving me the platform for it. Uh, anywhere you can buy books online. So Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, Powell's. Uh, you can go to alleyoop, to alia.com uh, to not just buy the book, but to read more about how I came up with the idea and, and some blog posts so you can keep track of what I'm doing. But anywhere you can buy books online, you can buy this one. And uh, I really appreciate you giving me the chance because these players are amazing individuals. They make an amazing contribution. Uh, to the state of Israel. They're really ambassadors and heroes, and, and I just want to get their story out as far and wide as I can. Well, yes, Mr. Goldstein, because like I said, this topic was actually new to me. I had no idea even to look up uh, black ball players in Israel, but uh, you mentioned blog posts, which takes me to another question as we conclude. Where can we uh, follow you social media-wise and uh, or, or read your blogs? Uh, so all the blogs will be on aliyuptaaliyah.com. Uh, you can also follow on Twitter, aliyuptaaliyah, uh, and Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash aliyuptaaliyah. So I'll be sharing and posting everything, uh, you know, so you can keep track of not just the book, but everything that's come from the book and speaking engagements and great interviews like this. Uh, so you can, you can follow anywhere. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, David Goldstein, thank you very much for joining us. And, for, uh, and to our listening audience, I'm Dashaun Farad. You've been listening to Right and Exact. We hope that you would join us next time. Hotel.